Welcome to the podcast for Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation and our world. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other, Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons or her husband. And when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. And with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and she set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And at this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, Naomi said, Your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Myra, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest.
thank you that in this ancient story, we see your heart, even in hard times. We have a picture of your loving kindness. We have a picture of your faithfulness to us in the midst of grief and loss. And God, I pray today that as we sit in your word and your Holy Spirit ministers to us, God, would you draw us close? God, I pray for hearts that are here today that are breaking, hearts that are are broken and need your healing. Would you draw us close to yourself and would you do what only you can do in our hearts to restore and to heal? For those that are grieving the loss of people or of dreams for the future, God, this morning, by your Spirit, Would you put hope in our hearts today? Hope for the future. Hope that you still see us and you still hold us and you'll never let us go. God, this morning, give us a fresh revelation of your loving kindness, your great faithfulness, your mercies that are new every morning, your steadfast love that never ceases. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Hey, why don't we thank Megan for uh, reading the uh, Ruth chapter one for us. I love listening uh, to Megan read. I love listening to her read the Word of God. We're starting a new series in Ruth uh, today. I've never preached the book of Ruth. I, I went through all my files hoping I'd done a bit of work on this before, and I haven't. Um, this is one of two books in uh, the Old Testament that's uh, named after a woman. It's quite a unique book. And we're going to discover that uh, Ruth is a great woman of God over the next four weeks. But this book is also a great piece of literature. And some of the beauty of the literature or the beauty of the, the artwork is lost when it gets translated from Hebrew into English But we're going to, as we read this story, you know, we're going to see that this is still a great piece of literature. Even in the English, it still reads like one of the all-time great chick flicks. Put your hand up here if you love a good chick flick. Come on, hand up uh, high. I got a confession to make this morning. A few weeks ago, I was home alone, and Joey and his mates came home and surprised me, and they caught me watching How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. And they've never let me forget it. I've got to be honest, I love that movie. I've watched it five times every time I watch it. I want to buy a Triumph Bonneville motorbike, just like Matthew McConaughey had. Come on, what about The Notebook? Anyone love The Notebook? Come on, hands up high. I'm honest, I do too. Every time I watch it, I start writing down Susan and our love story in a notebook. I don't know if I've told you this before, but she's a little bit older than me. And one day I might need to read it to her. (laughs) What about Notting Hill? Who loves Notting Hill? You know, every time Susan gets cranky at me because I make fun of her for being a little bit older, I just stand in front of her and say, just remember, I'm just a boy (laughs) standing in front of a girl asking her to love him. I love chick flicks. And just in case you think I've gone a bit soft since I started working for QB or I've had a frontal lobotomy in the last uh, you know, <laughs> few weeks, I do draw the line. I've never watched an episode of The Bachelor or The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or any other place around the world. Yeah, everyone's saying amen to that. You know, if you're here today and you're a real man, and you just exist on a diet of, uh, you know, Die Hard, Rambo, and the Shawshank Redemption, then uh, you might want to turn back a couple of books in the Bible, you know, kind of read Joshua and Judges, plenty of action, plenty uh, of violence. But uh, you want to thank me today, too. 
Because if you do get caught having to watch chick flicks with your girlfriend or, or your wife for the next four weeks, just bring her to church every Sunday. And her appetite, you know, for uh, romantic chick flick kind of uh, stories will be satisfied here in church. So something for everybody. Whether you love Rambo or you actually love Love Actually, I, I believe that God is going to reveal his loving kindness to us through this book. God's going to reveal his faithfulness to us in the midst of hard times. And to understand the depths of God's faithfulness, as we, as we read this book of uh, Ruth, we actually need to understand some of the names and places that are in uh, chapter one. And so I just want to spend a moment just setting up, you know, uh, the whole story uh, that we're going to go through over this next four weeks, because that's what the writer does here in these first seven verses. It takes to verse seven to actually get, you know, anybody in the story to actually say something. And so the writer, and we're not sure who the writer of the book of Ruth is, but it's an ancient book, probably 14, 1500 years old, has, uh, the, the writer is setting the scene for us so that we understand this story that's going to unfold. And so in the first seven verses, there's seven words that I think we need to understand. Let me race through them really quickly, but it'll help us understand the whole series. Firstly, uh, verse one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Okay, and so we need to understand that Ruth is living in the time of the judges. The first five books of the Bible, we see you know, creation, we see the patriarchs, we see the promises to, to God, to his covenant people. We see them in captivity in Egypt. We see them being set free, being delivered uh, by God. We see them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. We see the giving of the law in the first five books of the Bible. In the sixth book of the Bible, the book of Joshua, we see God using Joshua to lead his people out of the wilderness into the promised land. And then the seventh book of the Bible, the book of Judges, it's a time where they're in the promised land and God has raised up leaders or judges that would lead the people. But time and time again, as they're now in this place of prosperity, the judges would lead the people astray, lead them away from God. They'd forget all that God had done for them. And there was violence, there, there was poverty, there was injustice. It was not a good time, the time of the judges. And Ruth, the eighth book of the Bible, is actually set in that time, in the time of the judges, the book that uh, is, is just before it. And uh, then it says, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. There was a famine in the land, and so the house of bread had no bread. And we don't know exactly what part of the, the time of the judges Ruth is set in, but we know as we look through that story that they went through famines at different times because they turned their back on God. They had not followed you know, God's law. And so that's they're going through this, a hard time. There's a house of bread, has got no bread. And then it says in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Moab and Israel had bad blood right from the beginning. Moab did not have a good start to uh, them as a family that became a nation. Moab came about because Lot had an incestuous relationship with his daughter, and Moab was the son. And from Moab came the family of Moab, the Moabites, and they became a, a, in a region, they lived in the, the nation of Moab. And Israel looked at the Moabites as people who had turned away from God. They had a, had a sordid past and they were unfaithful. In Numbers chapter 25, we see that the Moabite women led the Israelite men astray and they were, they were unfaithful. There was bad blood between Israel and the Moabites where they were living. Verse 2 says the man's name was Elimelech. Elimelech means my God is king. 
And it seems that Elimelech had actually lost trust in God as king, and he'd actually left, you know, the promised land. He turned away, you know, from all of God's promises and gone to live in an ungodly land. But what we're going to see in this story is that even though people, you know, turned their back on God, our God still is king. And he's sovereignly working in some of the strangest of places. Number five uh, is Naomi. It says uh, his wife's name was Naomi. And Naomi is Ruth's mother-in-law. Put your hand up if you love your mother-in-law. Come on, put it up high. Some some of you need to get it up high because your mother-in-law's here. Not everyone loves their mother-in-law. You know, uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever, and some have suggested that's why Peter denied knowing Jesus, you know, at the end of his life. That's a little bit harsh, but you never know. But Naomi actually means pleasant. Naomi is a pleasant mother-in-law, just like my mother-in-law, who's watching online this morning. So it's great to uh, have you with us, uh, Kathy. I love you. You are a pleasant mother-in-law. Come on, if you're in the chat online this morning, why don't you just tell the whole world that your mother-in-law is pleasant? But Naomi means pleasant, Ruth's mother-in-law. Verse 4 and 5, it says, Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. We've already heard Moabites sorted past. Their women were known for being unfaithful. In fact, there was such bad blood that Moabites were not allowed to worship with the people of Israel for 10 generations. You got Moabite blood in you? You were segregated, you were ostracized from worship for 10 generations. Number seven, seventh word is simply Ruth. A Moabite woman named Orpah, and the other was Ruth. Ruth, the hero of the story. Ruth, the one who's got a a book named after her. She's a foreigner. She's a poor widow. She's a Moabite woman. She's an outsider. But because of her faith and her kindness... And because of the kindness and the faithfulness of our God, she's only one of only two women in the Bible that has a book named after her, and she's the only foreigner. She's the only, you know, one that's a convert to uh, to Judaism that has a book named after her in the Bible. It's an incredible privilege. I uh, celebrated with my family a new niece in our family. My sister in Sydney uh, had gave birth to this beautiful little girl. She might come up on the screen uh, on Friday. How cute is she? You know what her name is? Olive J. Smealy. Olive, because her grandmother on her dad's side's name's Olive, and my mum's name is Oliver. And so it's Olive because of those families. And her middle name is Jay. Now, most of you don't know that for the first 30 years of my life, I got called Jay rather than Jason. Everybody in my family in Sydney, the only person in Queensland that calls me Jay is Susan. But everybody in Sydney calls me Jay. And my sister rang me on Wednesday knowing she was getting induced on Friday and said, we're calling her Olive Jay, after her Uncle Jay. Incredible honour for your name, you know, to get passed down into the next generation. And this is what is happening for Ruth. This woman that's a rank outsider, you know, this woman that's a foreigner, this woman that comes from an unfaithful line, not only has a book named after her, but there's a special family in the New Testament where her name is mentioned again. But we're going to discover over the next few weeks because of the faithfulness and the kindness of our God. You know, the writer you know, sets this scene, those first few verses, of this great love story that actually begins with an incredible tragedy. You know, Elimelech has died both his sons have died, and one of them is Ruth's husband. 
And the first spoken word in, in this story actually comes from Naomi. Now, first words are important, you know, if, when you're a parent. You, you, you get your kid and no one else is around, he's going, dad, 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 say dad. Because you want dad to be the first word. When you're a grandparent, you get your granddaughter aside. You know, grandpa, grandpa, grandpa. As soon as the border's opened and I get down to Sydney, Jay, Jay, Uncle Jay. First words are important. Listen to the first words of Naomi in this great book. First words, go back. Go away. Leave. Go back to your mummy. Go home. I want you to leave me. They're the first words that are actually spoken by a person in this book. And Ruth had every reason to leave. She had every reason to go. She had every reason to say goodbye. Her husband was dead. His brother was dead. And in the law, you know, there was provision for when your husband died to marry your brother-in-law so that he could look after you. Put your hand up nice and high if you'd be happy about marrying your brother-in-law if your husband died. Just a tip. Don't put your hand up. Doesn't, <laughs> it's, no, it's not a good answer. But that was what's happening. And also, her... Her uh, uh, um, Elimelech was also dead. And so all of the men who could have possibly provided for her in this patriarchal culture where you needed a man to provide for you, they are all dead. And all of her dreams for the future are dead and buried. Ruth is barren. She hasn't had any kids. Ruth is a Moabite. She comes from an unfaithful line. And as she decides to go back, to actually stay with Naomi and go back to Jerusalem, she's got no confidence that she'll actually get a warm welcome. But she chooses to stay faithful anyway. And in a culture today that just on a whim moves from job to job or friendship to friendship or relationship to relationship or even marriage to marriage and church to church. I actually think there's something really important in this book for us to understand about the loving kindness and the faithfulness of God. I think God's got something to teach us about how to stay faithful to the people that he's given us, how to stay faithful in the place where he's put us and how to stay faithful when God hasn't come through for you yet. Firstly, let's just have a look at how to stay faithful to the people that God has given us. You know, when uh, Naomi tells Ruth and Orpah not to be confused with Oprah, who is incredibly wealthy and influential, and Orpah and Ruth have no wealth and they have no influence she says this beautiful prayer in verse 8. It says, May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. You know, Ruth, Ruth sees the kindness of her daughters-in-law and says it's a picture of the kindness that God shows to us. It's a picture of the kindness that God shows to his covenant people. And so she's in both situations, both in the human love between you know, mother-in-laws and daughters-in-law and, and, the, and the, the love of a God, the kindness uh, shown to them. It's the same word, and it's a word that's very, very difficult to translate into English. It's the word hesed in the Hebrew. And we don't have any one word that encapsulates you know, the, the power and the breadth of, of the word hesed. It's sometimes translated loving kindness sometimes steadfast love, faithful love, unfailing love, mercy. And it's kind of all of those things put together. You know, Sally Lloyd-Jones, who's a great theologian, well, actually, she's written the children's storybook Bible, which I thought might help me in this story. You know, she says, you know, and she probably is a great theologian, uh, but she says, you know, hesed love is a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever kind of love. Paul Miller, Miller says love, he said love is love 
without an exit strategy. It's a love that chooses to love even though there's nothing in return. It's a love that says, I'm sticking with you no matter what kind of love. It's the covenant love of God when he chooses a people and says, I am going to love you even though you don't deserve it. We don't have the word uh, hesed in the New Testament, but we, kinda, we have the same idea. You know, in 1 John 4, it says, this is love. Not that we love God. We didn't do anything to get this. We didn't do anything. We're not giving anything useful back to God. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now love one another in the same way. Naomi says, thanks for your loving kindness. I pray that you'd know that same loving kindness from God, but go. A love for his reply is a great word. She says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I'll die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Ruth says to, to Naomi, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm sticking with you till death do us part. Nothing is going to separate us. I'm loving you with a hesed kind of love. I think there's two key relationships for us today, you know, where we're called to love others in the same way, with that same covenant, committed, stubborn, faithful kind of love. The first is in your family. Verse 14, it says that Orpah eventually kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and said, yeah, fair enough, I'm going. This doesn't make any human logical sense to stay with you. But Ruth clung to her. It's the same word that we see in Genesis chapter 2 for man and woman coming together. It says in the, in the beginning, you know, God said man and woman would, would leave their mother and father and be united. They would cling together and become husband and wife. And what God has brought together, let no man separate. I want to encourage you today. It's this kind of love that we're called to in marriage. It's a covenant love. It's a faithful love. We're called, whatever happens, to stay faithful to our marriage vows. I want to encourage you today, stay faithful to pray for your family. Stay faithful to provide for your family. Stay faithful to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. This is love without an exit strategy. And I know for some of us here in this room, there'll be some broken family relationships. Whether it's there's friction in the marriage or you know, whether there's estranged you know, sons and daughters or other family members that have been separated. We're called to love and to be kind in the same way that Ruth is and says, I'm coming with you. I'm making the move to stay with you. I'm not going to separate from you. Now, I was very blessed to actually have seen this in my family growing up. My grandfather, you know, who I love, his name was Frank, and a lot of people called him Cranky Frankie because he did get pretty cranky. And there's a few people in my family and a few people on this staff that think I take after. You know, my, my grandfather, I get cranky occasionally. And he did get cranky and he did upset people at times. But what I watched him do from a very young age, he would always be the first to make the move to bring reconciliation and restoration. My dad doesn't get cranky at all. It kind of skipped a generation. Very, very placid. But I watched my dad do exactly the same thing. He was always the first to make the move, you know, to, to restore, to reconcile relationship. Let me just speak to the men just for a minute. Be the first to make the move. If there's friction in your relationship, if there's separation in your family, if there's heartbreak, 
be the first to make the move to bring together what no man should separate. It's a covenant love we're called to in marriage and in family. It's a stick at it kind of love. The other place, I think this kind of covenant love we're called to is actually in our church family. You know, there's a hundred one another's in the New Testament. God never had any picture. He says right from the beginning, it's not good for man to be alone. So he created, you know, family. When he, create, when he brings the church together, he, he never in his wildest dreams thought that every, anybody would have a solo faith, would have an individual faith. It's a one another kind of faith. And there's a pandemic of loneliness out there. And I don't think there's ever been a more important time, you know, for the church to love one another and to love everybody who walks through our doors with a hesed, I'm sticking with you and I'm not going to let you go kind of love. I had the privilege of visiting one of our life groups. You know, we've got, this this is something to celebrate. For the first time ever, we've got 3,000 people in our church in life groups. First time ever, 225 life groups. Can we just say thank you to all of our life group leaders that are making that happen? But I visited one on Wednesday night. People from all different backgrounds, all different you know, walks of life have come together. And one of the first things they said to me is, this has become family for us. This is a place where we've come to know God. And as right, the last thing someone said as I walked out the door was being part of this life group and being part of this church, we, we now understand that God is a loving Father. I went home on a high. I, I'm ringing people on my phone on the way home, just saying, this is an awesome night. It's the picture of loving kindness in the church. It's a covenant love. It's a sticking together. It's a doing life together kind of love, loving one another, the same selfless, stubborn, committed, covenant love that God loves us with. And if you've not worked it out yet, there are people in this church family who will annoy you, just like there's people in your own family that annoy you. But don't make that the thing, where you give up on church, where you give up on coming together. Make the move. Be the first to make the move to work it out. You know, at Gateway, we we actually do make a covenant together. As part of being a member of this church, is we we actually make a covenant to love God, to love one another, and and to live for Jesus. And a whole bunch of you know promises that we make to to one another. We covenant together. I want to encourage you, if this is your church family, this is where God has placed you, and you haven't yet become a member, down the barrel at the front here, a whole bunch of membership brochures, just uh, if that's your heart, that's the commitment that you want to make, you want to be in that kind of you know, covenant love with other people as we all different people follow Christ together, really encourage you to uh, become a member here. But we're to stay faithful to the people that God has given us because God never leaves us alone. It's never God's idea for us to be alone and he never leaves us alone. Romans chapter 8, it says, I'm convinced of this, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth will ever be able to separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Can I hear an amen this morning? You know, never... Never will we be separated from the love of God. God's made sure of it through what Jesus has done on the cross for us. We're to love each other in the same way. A love that doesn't separate, a love that sticks together. Stay faithful to the people God's given you and stay faithful wherever God has placed you. You know, after Naomi, you know, urges them to leave, as I said, Orpah kissed, you know, her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. And and, and Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. There was this belief in the ancient world that the gods that they had in any city had power over that city, over that region. And so in Moab that had many gods, 
you know, the, the gods of Moab had power over that region, and, and the God of Israel had, had power, you know, over uh, the, the region of, of Israel. And, and, and Naomi's saying, go back to your gods, where your God's present, where your God can help you. And, and Naomi, uh, Ruth says, I'm not going. I'm sticking with you. I'm clinging to you. And we need to understand the faithfulness of God, a faithfulness of Ruth in this story, but we also need to acknowledge Naomi's example in this story. You see, Moab did have gods. They actually had many gods, but their chief god was called Moloch or Chemosh. And it was a god that was, you know, they'd made a big stone altar for. And in front of the stone altar was a big stone ramp leading down into a fire. And do you know what the ramp was for? It was to roll children down as child sacrifices into the fire. That was their god. Sometimes we read the Bible and we think, you know, why is God, you know, allow nations to be wiped out? Sometimes nations are so evil that God says, this has no place in my plans for this world. They, all, they also, you know, had a, had a fertility goddess that they would worship. And the way they worshipped that goddess was to go into the temple and sleep with the prostitutes in the temple and then go back to your family and you'd be fertile then in your family. This was an evil city full of immorality. And Ruth has been looking at Naomi and she's been seeing Naomi's faithfulness, Naomi's devotion to God and devotion to her family, you know, in this evil city for at least the last 10 years. And she says, that God is better. I'm clinging to you. I'm going where you go. There's this great promise in, in Zechariah chapter 8. It says, this is what the, the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that God is with you. And this is what Ruth is doing with Naomi. She's clinging to her and saying, I've heard God is with you. I've seen God is with you. I'm going with you. I'm not letting go of you. I want to ask us today, are people clinging to the hem of your Levi's? Are people clinging to your rolled up chinos? Are people clinging to your stubby's ruggers? If they are, be careful. There's not much to hold on to. But are people hanging on to you? Are people clinging to you because they can see that God is with you? In a city today that's not quite as evil as Moab, but a city full of immorality, are we living our lives in such a way that people would look at our lives and the way we live and our example and say, God is with him. God is with her. I'm sticking with you. I want to encourage you today. Stay faithful wherever God has placed you. Because God is never far from you. You know, and Paul's preaching in another city full of idols, it says. In, in Acts chapter 17, he says from one man, he actually corrects, you know, the misunderstanding in the ancient world, you know, about God having, God's having different power over regions. He says there's one God and from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find that he's not far from any one of us. God has placed you where you are. He's positioned you on purpose because he wants others to seek him and find him because he's not far from any one of us. Stay faithful wherever God has placed you because God is not far from you. Right now, you might be in a job you don't like very much. While God has placed you there, stay faithful and serve with integrity so that people can see that God is with you. You might be walking through a season right now that you don't like very much. Stay faithful. And worship God with all of your heart, despite your circumstances. Keep lifting him up and finding peace and comfort in him so that those looking in at the difficult circumstances you're walking through will say, God is with you. 
People will hold on to your robe. People will hold on. They'll cling to you. Stay faithful wherever God has placed you because God is not far from you. Live a life that's so winsome that others will cling to you and discover that God is not far from them. You know, stay faithful to the people God's given you. Stay faithful in the place that, that God has uh, put you. And lastly, stay faithful when God's not come through for you yet. As Naomi and Ruth return to Judah, Naomi says this as they, they walk back into Bethlehem, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. She told them, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. You know, four times in those couple of verses, you know, Naomi says that God, you know, has brought, God has allowed this suffering in her life. And she used two different names for God. Firstly, she uses the name El Shaddai, which isn't so much a personal name. It's the God of Almighty. It's the God of all power. She says, El Shaddai has afflicted me and I am suffering. And then she uses another name for God. She uses that one twice as well. She uses Yahweh, the name for the covenant God, the personal God between the God who, who loves his people, who covenants himself to his people. We see here a picture of a God who is all powerful and a God who is all loving. He's full of loving kindness. And yet Naomi has come home empty. She's come home as a poor, barren widow. And she's going through a tough time. Life is hard. She says, life is bitter. And I can't see that it's going to get better anytime soon. These kind of times are a challenge to our faith. If God is all powerful and God is all loving, why has he not come through for me yet? Many people lose faith in these times, particularly in our modern, instantaneous, consumerist culture, wanting everything now. And maybe today you resonate with what Naomi's saying. You feel empty. You feel like life has become bitter and you're not sure it's ever going to get better. I want to encourage you today to stay faithful when God has not come through for you yet, because God's not finished with you yet. You know, every servant of God we read about in the scripture, you know, there is a gap between the promise of God and the provision of God. You know, Joseph, God promises him he's going to become a leader. His whole family will bow down to him. The next thing you know, he's in a, you know, thrown into a dark pit, and then a little bit later he's thrown into a dark prison cell. But God wasn't finished with him yet. God was positioning him right where he needed to be and where God would promote him through a miraculous means to become prime minister. And what others intended for harm, God used for good, the saving of many lives and preserving God's people and the promises of God You know, for the future. God wasn't finished with him yet. You know, God turns up and promises David, you're going to be the king, buddy. As a young man, he's thinking, you beauty, gold, glory, girls. The next thing he knows, he's hiding in a dark cave with a bunch of malcontents and he's got an evil despot chasing him around, wanting to kill him. But God was not finished with him yet. In that cave, he wrote some songs that have been sung by the faithful for the next three millennia. And God, in his time, in a miraculous way, made him the greatest king that this world has ever seen and the greatest king of Israel because God was not finished with him yet. And God made a promise that one day a new king would rise up and would sit on the throne of David. And he would rule with righteousness and justice and his kingdom would never end. And years later, as they'd been waiting, Jesus comes riding into town on a donkey. 
and the people begin to throw down their cloaks and they begin to call out words that David had written years earlier. Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the line of David and they begin to worship this king. But in the days to come, he too ends up in a dark coom, broken, battered body. He's placed in a dark tomb. But who knows, God was not finished with him yet. God was not finished with him yet. Because when it looked like all hope was lost and the women went on that Sunday morning to anoint a dead body in that dark tomb, an angel appeared and said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Jesus Christ, our suffering King, our servant King. Jesus is the King of all kings because he overcame the greatest enemy in this world, sin and death. And he's alive today and forevermore. And he's still seated on his throne and he will be for all of eternity. And he's the one we worship today. The King is alive. Can I hear an amen? There's always a gap between the promise of God and the provision of God. And God does some of his best work to fulfill his purposes in that gap. James, the brother of Jesus, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Stay faithful in the times when God's not come through for you yet. Because God's not finished with you yet. There's a resurrection coming. There's a day coming where there'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no more death, no more tears. Elimelech means God is king, but Elimelech died. But our God is still king. He's still sovereign. And he's still working all things together for good. The question is, will you stay faithful to God in the hard times? And will you allow him to work out his purposes in your life so that you can play your role in his eternal purposes? The last verse of this chapter we read says, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. At the end of chapter 1, there is grief, there is emptiness, there is bitterness, but the barley harvest is coming. And spoiler alert! With the barley harvest comes Boaz. And every good chick flick needs a Boaz. <laughs> God's not finished. Without giving away the whole story, this rank outsider, this foreigner from an unfaithful land, this poor widow, actually becomes the great grandma of King David. And her name is in the New Testament because from her family line comes King Jesus. I encourage you today, stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to the people God has given you. Stay faithful in the place where God has put you. And stay faithful even when God has not come through for you yet because he's not finished with you yet. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I, I'd really love us today to gather around some people that are hurting. I just felt this morning, as I was, I've been thinking all week, what are we going to pray for at the end? I just felt like this morning God said, I want you to pray for the grieving. Pray for those that are feeling loss. And there might be some of you here today who feel the loss of a son or a child or a spouse or a family member. There's still an emptiness and an ache in there. I believe God just wants to minister to you, minister his kindness to you. 
Some, some of you have lost a job that meant a lot to you. Some of you have lost a dream that you had for the future. And there's an ache in your heart. God just wants to say, I'm not finished with you yet. And some of you, the loss, this won't be for everyone, but some of you, the loss, you know it's actually impacted your faith in God's power to intervene today. I just believe God wants to minister to your heart. He wants to remind you of his loving kindness and his faithfulness. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask us to stand right now. Can we all stand? If you're here today and you just know there's loss, there's some heartbreak, I'm just going to invite you as I'm praying to walk to the front. I'm going to get in a minute, I'm going to get some of our church family to gather around you and just pray for you. But just while I'm praying, don't wait for us to start singing because it's going to happen before that. While I'm praying, just walk to the front. So we're called to mourn with those who mourn. I just know God wants to do something in your heart, broken hearts and grieving hearts here today. If that's you today, just walk to the front. I won't leave you standing here very long on your own. I'll get some people around you really quickly. But while I'm praying, just come and stand down the front. God, I thank you. Thank you that you are so merciful, you are so kind, that nothing will ever separate us from your love. Nothing, God, nothing in this lifetime, nothing in the next. God, not even angels, demons, death sickness, suffering, nothing will ever separate us from your love that you've poured out for us through faith in Christ Jesus. God, I just pray that you'd minister to the broken and the hurting this morning. Come and put your peace upon people and your comfort in people. God, restore broken hearts and restore faith. Jesus name. If anyone else just wants to come and stand with these guys, come right now. Here's an important moment for some of you. I just want to give you one more chance if you need to come. Just come. But what I'd love us to do is just gather around. Come and just gather around uh, these guys, stand with them. And just begin to pray as God puts a prayer in your heart. Come on, we're going to need some more people to come. going to pray really briefly and I'm going to let you pray and the team's just going to sing over us. Come Holy Spirit. Come and minister your kindness, your goodness and your grace. You're the God of all comfort and all peace. Come and minister to your people that you love today. Pray in Jesus' name. need a few more people to come and pray over here. Just begin to pray if you're standing with someone. Even if you're in the pews, just uh, someone down the front, you just need to pray for us, pray. The team's just going to sing over us for a moment.
thank you that every season your goodness and your grace is chasing after us. I thank you that you'll never let us go. I thank you that you work all things together for good. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You're our God and we worship you forever. We renew our faith in you today, whatever we're walking through. Hey, we just love praying for people down the front. Whatever it is that you just walking through right now, we've got some team down here who'd love to pray for you. We're going to keep praying for those that are here, but please just come. If you've got any need at all, we'd just love to stand with you as a church family and pray that you'd know God's grace. We hope you've been blessed by this message. We are a growing family and we'd love to see you at one of our Sunday services because everyone who comes through our doors is welcome. You can find out more about our community and locations at gatewaybaptist.com.au.